The Lisa Show, where we take a good look at life. my caregiving days. I would wake up every day after a restful nine hours of sleep with my makeup and hair flawless. I'd cook a homemade breakfast for my husband and children, kiss my kids on their rosy smiling cheeks as I send them off to school with kind notes in their homemade lunch boxes, clean the kitchen, help my husband get up, showered and dressed and do some laundry, help my husband with his physical therapy and medications, tidy up the home and mow the yard and weed the garden. Then and head off for a full day of work. I'd arrive there right on time at 9 a.m., have a productive, fully focused day at work without having to check my phone once. At 5 p.m., I would head home to cook up a three-course meal, healthy and full of protein, promptly served at 5.30 on a pristine pressed white tablecloth, and my husband and children would thank me for all of my hard work, to which I would respond modestly, oh no, it's nothing. I do it because I love you. We'd clear the table together and wash the dishes while singing songs as a family. I'd help my husband with therapies, feeding, dressing for bed, and another round of meds, and we'd watch the sunset together, holding hands. The children would be in bed by 9.30 p.m., and I would be in bed by 10, ready for another perfect day. Yeah, (laughs) no. Caregiving is many things, good and bad, heartbreaking and beautiful, but it is never, ever perfect. Honestly, in caregiving, perfection doesn't really exist. So why then do we sometimes set expectations for ourselves that look more like a perfect picture of domestic bliss? And why is it so hard not to beat ourselves up when we inevitably fall short? And when it comes to caregiving, why do we think we have to do everything and do everything Right. On this episode of The Lisa Show, we'll be tackling perfectionism in caregiving. Later, you'll hear my conversations with caregivers Kara Riska, Lauren Lowry, and Elizabeth Miller about their very different experiences trying to avoid letting perfectionism get the better of them. But first, I want to talk about what the impossible pursuit of perfection really feels like. I talked to Dr. Susan Madsen, a researcher on family dynamics and a caregiver herself, and here's what she had to say about what it's like trying to fit into a role that she didn't feel cut out for. So it really has been always throughout all time a very gendered job. It's mostly unpaid work and it falls to women. And I'll tell you, in more conservative religious societies, even more, but any place it falls to women. And many women embrace that. Many women try to embrace that, but struggle, me (laughs) and other people (laughs) like me. Like, I'm not really a caregiver. I'm nurturing in some ways. I love my children, but we're all called to do different kinds of things. It's not just expectations of other people on us. It's our own expectations of what caregiving is to us. And I saw my mother do caregiving a certain way. And I saw women in my faith community do certain things. So man, did I struggle because I just did not yearn and love the (laughs) caregiving like everybody else. And I was really hard on myself for a lot of years about that because I could never reach that perfectionism that I thought was how I should do caregiving. I used the should. I should do this. I should do this. I should. I beat myself up for a lot of years because I should like to do domestic duties more like cooking and sewing and all of these things. And I just didn't fit that box real well. Brene Brown, in her work on vulnerability and shame, describes how society tends to put a unique pressure on women. In her words, for women, shame is do it all, do it perfectly, and never let them see you sweat. Shame for women is this web of unattainable, conflicting expectations about who we're supposed to be. Dr. Madsen also spoke about this shame. I didn't get a job right after I graduated from college, but it was a bad economy. But women, when something goes wrong, we bring it in. We're socialized to do that. We say, 
I'm not good enough. That term right there is what, no matter where you live, what country you live, I mean, we go in, we say, it's me, it's my fault. And I will tell you, that is, is tough. And that really, it becomes a heavy load in caregiving. This rings true for me. It's so easy when you're caregiving and the stakes are really life and death to internalize every mistake. Brene Brown describes the difference between guilt and shame. She says that while guilt tells us that what we did was bad, shame tells us that who we are is bad. In a high stakes situation like caregiving, it can be way too easy to conflate the two. You know, it's okay to feel guilty because you messed up or lost your temper. That guilt can be motivation to do better next time, but we have to be really cautious not to let that guilt turn into shame. Shame tells us you messed up on this and that makes you a bad mom or a bad caregiver or just a bad person. And that's not true or fair. We mess up because we're human and we're just figuring everything out as we go. One of the caregivers I talked to was Kara Riska. Kara's caregiving journey started 12 years ago when her son, who was then two years old, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. The surgery that saved his life also left him with physical and behavioral disabilities. Kara is now a life coach for other moms of kids with special needs. Here's what she suggested as a way to avoid perfectionism while caregiving. I think that is the foundation of all the work I do, is self-compassion because it's death by a thousand suffering, struggling needles if we stay in that comparison, which then leads to guilt or shame. I think first is by noticing when we're judging ourselves and noticing when we're being really hard on ourselves Mm -hmm. and then bringing that curiosity, the kindness that leads to self-compassion and... I think there's nothing more destructive than what I call pain comparison. And uh, there's a couple different renditions of it. We Mm -hmm. try to make ourselves feel better because at least it's not as bad as that. So we should feel better, right? Or it's just diminishing what we have because it's not as bad as somebody else's. That is like so harmful to us because if we can't actually acknowledge and own our pain... And wow, this really hurts. This Mm -hmm. is really hard that we can't even get to this step of self-compassion. Yeah. Because we're just resisting and pushing it away or trying to compare it away. Way long ago. So this is probably like eight, 10 years ago, I was working on self-compassion. And at the time I was working with a coach and I knew I needed to work on it, but I really didn't know how. And I literally remember Googling over and over again because I thought I was going to find the answer, like how to have self-compassion. Oh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. surely the answer is out there I'm somewhere. I'm going to figure it out. This Where's the formula? formula? Give me the formula yeah. that I can follow. <laughs> and I love that I wanted it so bad that I was Googling it. I wanted to figure it out because I was clear that I did not know how to be self-compassionate. There's no formula. I think... It, for me, looks like a constant conversation of curiosity and kindness. So when we notice, hey, wow, you're being real uh, short with those kids of yours and bringing the curiosity, hey, what, what's going on for you? This is the self-conversation I'm having. What's going on? What's happening inside of your body? What do you need right now? It's a beautiful thing when you can identify what you need and then give yourself permission to give it to yourself. And so self-compassion to me looks like having those conversations over and over and over again and just allowing yourself to be where you're at. I love Kara's idea of an ongoing conversation with yourself. Having compassion on ourselves isn't something we become good at overnight, as nice as that would be. And our situations are constantly changing. Doing our best one day might look totally different than doing your best another day. And at the heart of it, and this was so hard for me to accept for a long time, while perfectionism pretends to be selflessness, in reality, it's really selfishness. Why? Because it solely focuses my time, talents, and attention on myself. 
In my experience, perfectionism is deceptive because it makes it seem like I'm just making goals, improving myself and working towards a goal, you know, like all worthy pursuits. It may seem like I'm serving others, being selfless and working hard and just trying to do some good. And it's so close, but it really is a grab for control. And I've always believed that the only control that you have is over yourself and your decisions. You can't control other people, nor should you want to. So I thought that really being in control of my decisions was a worthy pursuit, of course. But when the goal of what I'm doing becomes more important than my relationship or what is really needed, that's when it crosses over to being about me, inner, not outer focused. True, healthy self-improvement involves measurable goals, development, and learning that connects you with other people, while the pursuit of perfection, on the other hand, keeps you isolated because of the fear of shame at being found out. So I asked Kara about how she manages her inner dialogue so that she doesn't accidentally fall back into the trap of seeking perfection. This actually is something, the language that I learned from one of my coaching colleagues that is just brilliant, but it can be applied everywhere. And it's called business not as usual. We've all heard the state of California has declared a state of emergency. And I never really knew what that meant until I learned that when a state of emergency is declared, different laws come into effect. Mm. Different budgets become available. The governor can act in ways that he or she couldn't act if it wasn't declared a state of emergency. So what I do and what I encourage my clients to do is to declare a business not as usual. Wow. To recognize this is not a normal time. This is a time of intense caregiving. This is not a time where I can just pretend like everything is normal. And to put a time parameter on it, meaning that you give yourself a timeline but also with the expectation when you reach the end of that timeline, you will redeclare. Hmm. So what that could look like for my son, we headed into a surgery. We were expecting that he was going to be in the hospital for a week. It turned into three weeks. So what that could have looked like is, okay, if he's going to have surgery on a Monday, I will declare a business on as usual probably for the whole month, if I was honest. But once we got to that point, I'd realize, oh, you know what? Like we are still in it. So I'm going to declare we're going to be in this state for another month and reevaluate as we get to that date and give ourselves permission to ask for more help. Not even just permission. Charge ourselves with asking for more help. And I think we under ask in this area all the time. Yeah. Even I do this, even though I'm very aware that it's so good. It's really hard to constantly feel like you're asking for help. So also different funds would be available, right? I might spend money differently in this business not as usual than I would outside of it. Could look like I'm going to eat out as much as I want versus trying to keep a certain budget. So I think there's a lot of different shifts that we can make available to ourselves when we, with intention, declare that this is not a business as usual season. Kara was talking about short-term crises, how when a huge crisis is afoot, like a surgery or a trip to the emergency room, it's okay to let things go for a little while. But this advice can apply to long-term caregiving too. Even if you're not actively in the middle of a life-threatening crisis, caregiving is intense. Life isn't going to look exactly like you wish it would while you're caregiving. Maybe instead of cleaning the house yourself, you'll have to ask for help from someone else. Or maybe you'd really like to pack school lunches for your kids, but you have to send them to school with lunch money instead. And that's okay. And I hope this is something we keep in mind in every conversation we have about caregiving, that we don't have to be perfect at any of this. We'll be hearing from a lot of caregivers with a lot of different experiences, and they'll be sharing tips about things that have worked for them. But just because something worked for them doesn't mean you have to do it too. None of us have this down. We're all just trying to figure it out as we go. And sometimes you'll find something that works, like a life hack or a self-care trick, and then your situation will change. And the things that used to work just don't anymore. 
And that's okay too. When I was a caregiver, I used to go running a lot just to get out of the house and literally run away from all the stresses of caregiving. And it was so nice. But eventually things became more intense and running just wasn't what I needed anymore. I didn't have time for it. And it was just another thing on the list. And I ended up not running for a while. And that's okay. You don't have to be perfect at self-care or asking for help or any of this. You don't even have to be perfect at overcoming perfectionism. It's an ongoing battle, and some days will be better than others. Lauren Lowry is the mom of a seven-year-old son with a rare genetic disorder and a six-year-old daughter she adopted out of foster care. Here's what Lauren had to say about perfectionism. I have always, at least the past few years, said I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> Not recovered because it's kind of like an addiction, right? You know, you're always in recovery. Right. That's how I feel it's with perfectionism. Never ends. Because perfectionism, I think a lot of people think, oh, that's you wanting things to be perfect. No. Perfectionism is me thinking that I can't do anything good enough. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism is saying I'm not good enough. Not necessarily like, oh, everything needs to be perfect. It's I'm not good enough until everything is perfect because that feels for some reason lower than everybody's just basic. So it really comes from a place of self-love and saying, I am worthy, I am enough, I am not my actions. I am more than my actions. Those are just things I do. <laughs> and it's just like, those are thoughts that I think. I'm not my thoughts. Those are just sentences in my brain. And as a mom with perfectionism, it can be really easy to see everything going on around you, seeing the laundry pile up, that laundry basket, things like that, seeing you know your child maybe not hitting all the milestones or not succeeding in the way that you thought. And it can be really easy to say, that's my fault. Mm. I'm not doing enough. I'm not being a good mom. I want to be a good mom. But whenever we have those tendencies and we're striving for that perfectionist motherhood, what we end up doing is stressing ourselves out more, burning ourselves out even more, which ends up leaving us exhausted, angry, kind of irritable. And as a good mom, we should just say, a good mom just loves her kids. I love this. And I think it applies to all caregivers. We don't have to be perfect. We're already enough. And by saying it or getting it into our heads and using this language when we talk to ourselves can really affect how kind our inner monologue is. And that matters. As long as we love our kids or whoever we're taking care of, and of course we do, or we wouldn't be doing this, then we're enough. Maybe it was the majority of women, I feel like we have this a little bit like the control freak. We want to drive the boat, right? This is Elizabeth Miller, a certified caregiving consultant who's been a caregiver her entire life for her parents and for her brother. I asked her if she had ever felt like she just wasn't good enough as a caregiver. I have felt that way. Yeah. And I think for me, it was like if I could look at the mirror at night and be like, Elizabeth, you did as much as you could possibly give today. How could you possibly not be enough? Elizabeth talked about the oxygen mask analogy we sometimes use. You have to put the mask on yourself first before you can help someone else, right? And maybe that's how it works when you're in a short-term crisis. But Elizabeth realized that an even better metaphor for ongoing caregiving is that a caregiver is like a mother bird with a nest full of starving baby birds demanding attention. You're kind of in a no-win situation. It never stops. My work needed me, my kids, my house, my dogs, my relationships, my caregiving relationship too. And there was never a win. And I can imagine that's how a mother bird feels when she comes back and they're all screaming and she's like, how do I feed all of these things? And so you make the best decisions with the information you have at the time. And you have to also feed yourself that nourishment or you're not going to be able to fly out and get any more worms. So that was kind of the aha moment hmm. for me. It was like, okay, you don't need to feel guilty about this. You might feel guilty about it. And guilt is a natural emotion that creeps up because we want to serve all these people. Our heart's always in the right place, but it's not realistic to think that. And so when the guilt comes up, then I just try to give myself and hopefully give other people grace about that. 
I love what Elizabeth is describing. In the same way that we're trying to be better and better at caregiving, we can also get better and better at giving ourselves grace, forgiving ourselves for where we're falling short and applauding the ways in which we're doing great. I wanted to talk to Laura Hernandez. She's a mom to 10 kids, three of whom were adopted through foster care and have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She shared with me how, as a very religious person, she learned to give herself that grace and let go of some of her guilt around not being a good enough mom. I was always taught that if I do X and Y, that I would get the Z result, right? So if I raise my children in the Lord and I teach them scripture and I do all these things, that I'm going to have these perfect little kids. Like that's, nobody ever really said that, but that's kind of the message you get. The same with adoption of like, hey, if you provide this safety, if you do these things, if you work on attachment, then you're going to have this great attachment with this kid and it's going to be a wonderful adoption, right? And I have just found over and over and over again that that is not true. And I was recently working with my therapist on just like, hey, I'm really struggling. Like, what did I do wrong here when my kiddos is really struggling right now? And so I was like, what did I do wrong? Because I don't want to do it again with all these other children. Like, (laughs) this is obviously something I did because I can control it, right? And she said to me, she said, if an all-powerful God has children that stray away from him, he doesn't think he's a bad father, so why should you think you're a bad mother? Two days later, I wake up and I am have this weird like dream situation. I woke up with me and my friend walking through this fire and something saying like, I'm going to burn away the dross. And whoever says that. So I'm like, the only way I know that, I know that that's a verse somewhere, but I don't know where it is. So I went and looked it up and it's like Isaiah 1. So reading the whole chapter for context, Isaiah 1, 2 says, I had children, I raised them well, and still they departed from me. And so I was like, okay, thank you, Jesus. That's a beautiful, like, okay, we got that. And then that day, I have, in the morning, I have my quiet time and I read my Bible and then I read a book. And I had this book that was sent to our house by mistake from Amazon for somebody else out there in the wide world. I don't know who it is, but I got the book and they told me to keep it. And I said, okay, I will. It sat on my table for a year and I had just recently started reading it. And I'm like in chapter four and I open it up and she's talking about the X plus Y equals Z lie that we often believe. And she quotes that verse that I had children, I raised them well, and still they departed from me. And it was just kind of this beautiful, like the therapist, the dream, the verse, the whole thing was just a beautiful package of like, I have zero control of how my kids are gonna turn out and I can do everything I'm supposed to do. And it may look just completely not at all how I thought it was going to turn out. And that's okay. While Laura and I don't have the same religious beliefs, I took a lot from her experience. Ultimately, we aren't in control of the twists and turns life throws at us. As tempting as it is to try to control it all and then blame ourselves when things, of course, don't go the way we want them to, there's something very freeing in realizing you don't have control. I mean, it seems obvious when you say it like that, right? No, none of us can magically make everything better, and we certainly can control other people. Duh. But sometimes we still blame ourselves when things go wrong and think, man, if I had just been a better caregiver, this wouldn't have happened. And 99% of the time, that's just not true. Things will go wrong. And that's because we live in a really messy world, not because you weren't good enough. I remember a time when I was going through a less than perfect caregiving moment and I tried to let myself off the hook in that moment. And remembering this time has helped me years later. And it's a story about wearing a suit to church. So in marriage, there's no real way to rate how well I'm doing as a spouse in concrete terms because it's a relationship and not a task or a job. But when I'm a caregiver of my spouse, and parents do this all the time in relation to their kids, it's so easy to judge myself based on the level of care and comfort he experiences. You know, his experience, not mine. So if I'm doing my best and he's still uncomfortable or worse in pain, then that's what matters, not my effort. And this was extremely difficult for me. I was trying my best, my very best. But my best when I haven't slept through the night in years is different when I do, you know? My husband, Christopher, who at the time was in the advanced stages of ALS and was in a wheelchair, had this want. And it's a simple request, first of all. I just want to say that, you know, I've tried to imagine 
what it must have been like for him, stuck in his body, unable to move or speak, torture. And he was such a good sport about it. That sounds too weak. He was a champion about it. He was frustrated, of course, and claustrophobic. And he worked through it. So his requests, big or small, were nothing. They were all about maintaining what little control he had over the decisions on how his life was rolling out. So this simple request was that he wanted to wear a suit to church. Now, as the one to shower and dress him, I just want to point out that putting a suit on, which consists of a dress shirt, dress pants, shoes, socks, suit coat, and tie, was no simple feat than, say, putting on a stretchy polo shirt and some athletic pants. But I would do it and show up sweaty to church, but it's a simple request, and it gave him a sense of control. Fine. But a couple of Sundays, I would say something like, hey, no one's going to care if you show up to church in a polo shirt and dress pants. Let's just do that today. It was on days when I was particularly tired. And he would look at me and say, no, I like to wear a suit. It's just once a week. That's what I do. We could read each other's minds like a married couple at this point, you know, (laughs) even though he couldn't speak. I knew exactly what he wanted to say. And one day... I went into our shared bathroom and I silently screamed and shook. And if you don't know what I mean, then good for you. And I looked in the mirror and I distinctively thought, don't you ever beat yourself up later and look back and think you didn't try. This is so hard and you're doing it. You remember this. You are doing your best and it's okay to be mad about it. I don't know where that came from. I think I knew in the back of my mind that I would judge myself harshly when taking care of him was all over. When he was gone and I knew I would give anything to be taking care of him because it was worth it. I wanted to remember that it was hard. And although I'm not the perfect angel wife who never complained, oh yeah, I complained, I complained a lot. Chris did end up wearing his suit to church, but I complained and I made jokes and I cried and I tried my hardest. And I'm so glad that I remember that moment. I've needed to remember it a lot. Every caregiving situation is different, especially as it relates to your relationship with the one being cared for, spouses, friend, parent, a child. I wanted to know if this was a universal feeling or if this applies to all caregivers. So I asked author and caregiver advocate Suzanne White about the experience she and her siblings had caring for their parents. We were frightened and worried about someone being hurt that we loved. Yeah, and suffering. Really dearly. There's no heartache in the world like worrying about someone you love and if they're safe or not. It's the thing that nightmares are made of. Yeah. If we don't share it and we, we don't eat right and we don't try to sleep and you know what I mean? If we don't really work hard at ourselves, with ourselves to take care of us, That heartbreak is so overwhelming. When you love someone and you're caring for them, it's such a huge responsibility and so overwhelming. And we're in the middle of it and we don't want to screw it up. And we're so hard on ourselves. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have to make adjustments. And like my parents, I promised both my parents that they were going to die at home and neither of them did. So I had to make adjustments. Sure. But I never gave the job up. Caregivers don't give the job up, right? They're there for the long haul. And it's just extraordinary to me. Something you take on and there's a power within us that, that powers us through it. It is so hard. And the bottom line of it is we're giving service to someone else. We're doing the best we can. And they know... They know we're trying to do the best yeah. and the love that we give them and the feeling we give them so they can feel safe. Beating ourselves up is so horrific because we're doing everything humanly possible to make someone. I always, you know, there's a wonderful saying of we're just walking each other home. Mm-hmm. You're walking someone home. You can't fix that. You can't fix them. You just need to be there for them. And by walking through a door in a bedroom, you're doing that. 
And I just realized recently that my whole thing, like all these conversations and everything I say and I write about and everything that's in the book gets boiled down to it's okay and be kind to yourself about it. Whatever it is, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're going through before, after, in between, it's okay and be really kind to yourself around it. I hope this episode has helped you let go of some of the pressure to be perfect. Learning to give ourselves grace is not an easy process, and it's definitely not a straight line. We all have days when we feel better than others. That's just life. But we can all give ourselves a little more grace when we fall short of perfection. As ridiculous as it sounds, I remember a time where I really thought I could be perfect at managing my perfectionist tendencies. I remember being completely overwhelmed and so tired I could fall asleep standing up and thinking, I'll just make a list so that I'm not so hard on myself and that will show me how to let things go. I'll be perfect at managing my perfectionist tendencies. Yeah, I really thought that on some level without a hint of irony. My plan did unravel quickly, though, because, you know, after you make your checklist on things to let go of, what do you choose to let go of? The loved one you're caring for? No. Your kids? No. You? I mean, it seemed like that was the only choice, but it didn't seem fair. You want to take care of everyone, but you can't. Because there was literally no other choice, I started learning to let go of some very good things I wanted for myself and for others, especially my husband and kids, and just pick up on the essential ones. Life got simple, and in that forced simplicity, I learned that it was important for me to mourn what I had lost. No one else really fully recognized it and could do it with me because they wanted different things and because my intense caregiving path wasn't over. Everyone tried to bully me into being grateful. What they didn't know is that I was grateful, probably more grateful than I had ever been in my life, but grateful for two opposite things, grateful for then and grateful for now. So I had to mourn the way of life, the plans, the way we were and love it and miss it, and then turn away from it and start living a different life. This thing called letting things go was excruciating for me. It was the opposite of easy, freeing and simple, but it was worth it. So when people ask me for advice on how to take care of someone with ALS or how to take care of someone in a really difficult situation, I know they want tips and tricks and hacks, and I have them, sure. But what I say and what I really mean and say with empathy and deep love is, you're gonna have to learn to let some things go. I for one know that sometimes God has given me more than I can handle, no question. And there was no possible way I could have been a perfect caregiver in those moments. But I have also been given strength, physical, emotional, and spiritual as a result. And coming to that conclusion took a lot of time to accept. I have a different understanding of my life's purpose. And I recognize with a lot of humility, because I still regularly complain about this, that it's not about me being perfect in anything. It's about me being whole, complete. That's a better focus because we can't be complete or whole without attending to all our needs. And we can't ignore others in that process of completeness. Where the pursuit of perfectionism left me more frantic and anxious, focusing on completeness leaves me feeling grounded and fulfilled. And it leads me to acknowledge the grace of God in a more complete way and opens my eyes to different ways that we're all connected to each other. It feels better. It's more satisfying. 